Well, like it for you know, it, the breath is uh, is used uh, because it it's a physiological function. You know, it's it's happening now. Not you don't have to create it or imagine it. And you're breathing wherever you are. You know, so you're you know whether you're in a peaceful place or a warlike place, and then and then also. It, it is, uh, it brings you into the present, it'll stop the thinking, the wandering mind, you know, you, you concentrate on the breath and you, to do that you have to, you know, you have to stop thinking and so it's a way of, of focusing on something that's happening right now that is not going to, you know, get caught up in kind of your ego about, you know, your, your ego isn't really involved with breathing. And so, uh, it's not about whether you, how good you breathe or breathing better than somebody else. It's just like this, the inhaling, exhaling. It also, as a concentration object, as a samatha practice, it, it leads, it calming. You tend to go into tranquil states, very refined, you know, into more refined, uh, conscious experiences. Because it, it, because it, you know, as you, concentrate on the breath uh, and, and you stop the wandering mind from getting carried away, then you, it will lead toward uh, tranquility. And then uh, as a vipassana, as a vipassana object, it's, it's uh, you know, the insight practices, it, it's the pattern of all conditioned phenomena, you know, it's the rising ceasing. And so, you know, it it's, uh, you know, it's, that's what all conditioned phenomena are like. You know, that's the, the pattern. What arises ceases. And, and then inhaling is like this. And you can only inhale so long and then you have to exhale. So, and, and then I, I noticed when I was developing Anapanasati, you know, I found out it's easy to concentrate, to keep the concentration on the inhalation. But the exhalation, the mind tend to wander off. And I noticed that, you know, how uh, somehow this was a, a pattern of, I found it quite simple to be aware of the full inhalation, but the exhalation, I noticed the, the mind tend to wander away. And just noticing that, you can see so much of just the pattern of, say, you know, how we like inspiration or we want happiness and inspiration and youth and and uh, all the good things and then when it goes the other way we tend to look for something else to you know so in in uh, vipassana or in insight practice you're looking at the way things are and so you you're beginning to notice that this pattern uh, you know how much of emphasis in modern life is about youth and success and, and uh, uh, good health and beauty and all this and and, and then uh, and how much ignored or unwanted the information about old age, sickness and death is. You know, that, because that doesn't inspire the mind. You know, we don't, you know, most people don't look forward to old age and sickness and death, what we dread. So, so then the Buddha, you know, is putting so much emphasis on this other side, on old age, sickness and death, because that's where we tend to lose our, you know, we, we tend to be most blind, most ignorant. And uh, then the, the breath is, just noticing that myself, how, how uh, you know, the, the tendency to always seek when something reached an unpleasant phase, you know, when it's inspiring, everything going well, and then, then when things aren't inspiring, when things are, you know, falling apart, how then one looks for something else, like another inspiration or a distraction. So you, 
you're contemplating this rebirth process, how mental it is, you know, how we're seeking rebirth all the time in, in something that, like, a, a sensory pleasure, or distracting the mind, you know, watching television, or, or doing something when we're bored, or uh, frightened, or anxious. We want to get away from that, so we tend to, to, to distract the mind, or seek rebirth in some other condition that is sens uh, maybe sensually pleasing, or exciting, or interesting. And then, then you can't sustain that, you know, when something interesting eventually becomes boring. And then we tend to drop it there and look for something else. So, and, and just observe that, like in a monastic life, you know, you have a lot of boredom to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite deliberate, you know, intentional, the boring way to live. Because <laughs> then you're encouraged to, you know, rather than try to spice it up and make it interesting, you, you're actually learning to endure to the, where boredom ceases. You know, then you begin to find the balance between, you know, you don't, you are no longer dependent on <coughs> having interesting things to do or becoming something. But like the, the, the body itself, like your physical body, so you have the sitting, standing, walking, lying down, postures, uh, in, especially in teaching meditation, you begin with this because you're trying to get people to to pay attention to that which is here and now before it gets too personal, like posture, uh, like sitting. It, it, we're not emphasizing the perfect posture, you know, that you have to try to get, but just sitting or standing, walking, lying down as kind of ordinary movements that you do through the the day and night throughout your life, and and uh, then you, uh, and it's a way of bringing attention to the body that isn't vain, or trying to exploit it in some way, make it into something else, but observe, like sitting, the experience of sitting is like this, so you, you're observing the body sitting rather than trying to, uh, maybe, you, maybe you have an ideal of how you, good posture, and you're always trying to make your body do that. And, uh, and so then the posture becomes caught up with the, with the ego. But the important thing is to is, is use the body as an object because it's here and now. The breath is here and now. And as you reflect like this more and more, you, you stop this tendency to just be caught up in thinking, analyzing, criticizing. And that's where, you know, the like doubt comes from always uh, thinking about things and and uh, trying to analyze and figure everything out. Where in the personal meditation, you're just bringing attention here to the way it is, such, uh, such as something fairly, uh, you know, the reality of now is the body's like this, the breathing is like this. And then you have like the uh, like the four foundations of mindfulness, where you have like the jitta, or the feeling, the vedana, uh, you know, so you, you become, you begin to notice uh, pleasurable, painful, and neutral feeling, just on the physical level. And and the, when I started doing this, you know, like, usually aware of pleasurable and painful, but neutral physical feeling, I, I never paid much attention to. <laughs> so, so I started be, just noticing neutral sensations, like the way the the robe touches the skin or something that's neither pleasant nor painful, but it's certainly, it, you know, it's neutral. But you certainly, you know, it's you, you, once you pay attention, you see, you can recognize it. It's like this, uh, just uh, one hand on top of the other, the things that. Uh, sensations that, uh, you know, you, one doesn't bother to pay attention to until they start becoming uncomfortable. So as you move toward that 
neutral Vedana, you also start relaxing. You know, it's, it's not exciting or it's not uh, pleasurable, so you aren't trying to hold it or you're not uh, uh, trying to get rid of pain and discomfort. But, you know, so much of our experience as human beings throughout our life is rather neutral. It's neither pleasant or painful, but it's like this. And then, uh, Titanupasana, like I found that this was, uh, like when I went to stay with Ajahn Chah, uh, he, he taught, you know, he instructed me a lot with that, with his observing the, the, the jitta or the, the mind itself. Because, uh, you know, when I came here, I didn't, I couldn't speak the language and, Nobody could speak English, so I had to, you know, there's a lot of uh, frustration, uh, you know, trying to figure things out and feeling, and various reactions that, that I've had in regards to not understanding what's going on, or misinterpreting, or being frustrated, uh, and then I could easily misunderstand, because Thai and, you know, ties react differently, and I could misunderstand and and get upset by something because of, uh, you know I would think they were making fun of me or disparaging me. I get I used to get quite paranoid, and then Ajahn Chah would would uh, you know his whole method was of getting me to look at my feelings, which was I could do. You know, I began to observe. So, that first year when I was learning the language was, uh, I did an enormous amount of Chitanupasana because that I, you know, I, the, there's so many kind of negative feelings I had to bear with and, and just trying to, you know, I, you know, I didn't, I, you know, before he, he emphasized this, I didn't really know how to deal with it. So, uh, like I remember, uh, just little things, a lot of the rules, and the, they, they keep very strict, uh, you know, discipline. Well, I've never done anything like that, and then, uh, and so I remember, um, you know, this respect for the teacher, and so, you know, like in the, when Ajahn Chah had come back from, arms round, you know, we'd be sitting in the dining hall and and then we'd see him coming and then maybe most of the monks would get up and run out to wash his feet and then, and so I thought, well, there's plenty of monks doing that, I don't need to do that. And, you know, uh, so I'd sit there and then thought, one of the monks said, you should go out and wash Ajahn Chah's feet. And I, and I thought, no, there's so many doing it, they don't need me. This is a American mind. <laughs> and then I became quite negative about it, so I'd see them, see this happening every morning, and, and I'd sit there kind of fulminating, and, stupid, you know, look at what they're doing, you know, I'm not going to do that. And then, <laughs> and then one morning I had this insight, I saw how miserable I was sitting there, thinking like that. So I got up and rushed out and helped wash Ajahn Chah's feet. <laughs> and of course it stopped, you know, the suffering was gone. I didn't, you know, that was, even though I wasn't, you know, functionally needed to do that, at least I stopped this, this awful me mental, this negative uh, aversion to it. And, uh, so I mean, that was quite an insight for me, because, you know, it's so easy, you know, for, especially if you're not part of the culture, and, uh, and you're from a different social background, different society, how, you know, you can form very strong views and critical attitudes about how you see what they're doing. And, and so I, I began to observe this, you know, this is, this uh, critic, because I'm, I have a very critical mind. I could 
began to observe it rather than just believing it or or feel guilty about being so critical. So that's jitanupatsana, you know, where you're observing the emotional reactions. And then, then, then tamanupatsana is where you're really using the dhamma. You're seeing things in terms of dhamma, like Four Noble Truths, dependent origination, and all the rest of these. You're changing, you know, the, these dhamma teachings then are, are, you know, the way that one you use them to to uh, they help you to see things in in a in a dhamma way rather than from uh, personal assumptions or uh, emotional reactions or Western Western ways of thinking. So it's like you're you actually this word dhamma is. Now, for me, the word itself, you know, really, before it was like a Pali word in Buddhism, and then you translate it as the truth or ultimate reality or things like this. But then, uh, so it, you know, oftentimes remained uh, like a, and then you, you, we tend to incorporate it into English context. Uh, we practicing the Dhamma, and we take refuge in the Dhamma, and things like this. But then, uh, in Dhammanupasana, Sariputana, you start knowing Dhamma in a way that isn't, isn't interpreted through uh, your, own, your, your own language. And so then you, 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 you know, the, the reality is Dhamma. And, and it, reality isn't what somebody thinks it is. It's it's it has to be seen through wisdom rather than through perception. And so that's like a shift from from the you know the uh, conditioned mind to the unconditioned to awareness and mindfulness. <coughs> 